Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Dr. Marie-Helene Peltier, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Vancouver, Canada. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about teaching mindfulness, self-care, and maintaining healthy habits in and out of the workplace. We spend the vast majority of our waking hours at work. Um, we need to be able to engage with work in a healthy, meaningful way, and oftentimes, uh, many people have kind of this mentality, whether you're a leader or kind of a line worker, people tend to have this mentality of I'm going to just go to work, it may stink, I'm going to suck it up, I'm going to do my work, uh, and then go home and hopefully recoup. Um, and there's nothing wrong, I suppose, with that general mentality and, and some types of work are, are um, perhaps mentally or physically harder than others. But generally speaking, you know, we need to to recognize the need for self-care. We need to understand that work doesn't necessarily have to be a slog. Um, just because some work, you know, has different characteristics than others and maybe more physical than others or more psychologically challenging than others, work can be energizing. It can be, uh, it can be something that really enlivens us and helps us um, get excited about our day. And so I like your approach towards this mindfulness conversation and healthy habits that can help us have a better, more meaningful, more productive work life. It certainly can help us have a better uh, personal life with our families and our communities uh, and to just be happier, uh, healthier and uh, do better things and more cool things, which I think is what we all want to do. As we get started, I wanted to share Marie's bio with everybody. Marie Helene Peltier is a practicing resilience and anxiety psychologist and experienced senior leader with over 20 years of experience in clinical counseling and workplace psychology by working with various leaders and professionals. She is a virtual and in-person keynote speaker and conducts workshops to guide successful professionals to achieve health and happiness through resiliency practice. I love all of that. And as you can tell from that bio, that's really where the focus of our conversation will be today. Uh, anything else that you would like to highlight MH today as we dive on into the conversation? Well, you've, you've um, highlighted many key important points that uh, we'll talk about the, the importance of um, really front loading in a number of ways on our resilience. And part of my background is both coming from psychology and business. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of what I do in my work, bringing the two together so that we become even more strategic about our uh about our resilience and so i think that's the that angle the fact that um some people have called me a translator <laughs> in some mm. ways to bring psychology to business bring business to psychology so that in that intersection we can actually use what we know from research in a realistic way given how life looks like and i agree with your other comment um while we may focus say on the professional side it does encompass both everything, professional yeah. and personal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start with a bit of a conversation around burnout, causes of burnout, symptoms of burnout, uh, and really what that does to us as, as individuals and as human animals that seek connection and needs, we need relationships and burnout can cause a lot of challenges. Yes, yes, it can. And it is good for everyone to have this on our radar so that we can ideally be even more proactive in catching these signs because the main problem is that we will have signs and we will ignore them so mm -hmm. first let's go to what does it look like but then i'll bring it back to what are the early signs so hopefully we can yeah. uh, be on the proactive side here avoid some pain and you know all these things we we don't need 
So burnout, as uh, defined by the World Health Organization, three main characteristics. One is we're exhausted. Uh, that one is the one most people equate the word with. Uh, but in the actual definition, and it is an occupational phenomenon, so not a diagnosis. Um, so we're exhausted, number one. Number two, we are cynical. Uh, there is no hope that anything is going to change and it's always going to be like this. We've lost that hope there. And third, it starts having uh, an impact on our performance. So sometimes we think we can just suck it up, keep going, put your head down, keep uh, keep producing the same way your standards have always been, it gets to a point where, want it or not, you're going to send the wrong proposal to the wrong client. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and at some point it hits your brand. It, it's, you know, what you've taken years to build. So if we go upstream a little bit before getting exhausted, we're just having less energy than we used to. But again, we tend to ignore that, right? Uh, before getting cynical, we're just less less engaged, less excited about what we do. And before we are you know, seeing significant impact on our performance, we're starting to have more things fall through the cracks. Mm. But you know, even as I say this, we're all thinking, well, yeah, I could easily ignore all this because it's not yet red light flashing. It's sort of a light yellow. And because I'm so busy, I will ignore them. But then if we ignore them, it can lead to burnout, which then leads to potential more diagnosis level of anxiety, depression, and other diagnosis on the physical side, like high blood pressure and others. Yeah. And there absolutely are those physical components that will accompany uh, high levels of burnout. I appreciate yeah. you highlighting some of those early signs of my guess is we can all relate <laughs> to, yes, we can. To, to that, um, which means, you know, that, you know, great, if you can catch it early, what are you going to do about it? It's just like any medical diagnosis, right? You go to, you have your well checks, you go in for your annual physicals, hopefully to, you know, do blood work, to, to have, you know, that test so that you can know if there are some warning signs so you can start to be proactive about addressing it with, you know, different healthy exercise or eating habits or sleeping habits or whatever. All of this plays in, of course, to what we're talking about with burnout as well. And I'll also note, I mean, probably everyone feels cynical from time to time, right? Um, you know, people like to complain about their boss. They like to go get a drink after work with their coworkers and complain about this, that, or the other. Like th those types of things. It's, it's one thing to do that on occasion to kind of, you know, have those cathartic kind of conversations. It's one thing, you know, to have that happen. It's a completely different thing altogether to just have lost all hope <laughs> towards uh, improvement, towards anything getting better and where you're just day in, day out, cynical, pessimistic, and, and frustrated with how things are going at work, uh, especially if you're one that dispositionally isn't necessarily always inclined that way. And if you're someone who has been an optimist and someone who has been proactive in how you do your work and collaborating with others, and all of a sudden you start to see yourself dipping into that pattern, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a telltale sign uh, that something needs to change. And, and, you know, maybe some things could change or need to change organizationally or with leadership, but you don't always have control over those things. And so you have to look inwardly and see what can I change? Uh, what are different habits I can have, different mindsets I can foster so that I can nip this in the bud a bit and and not get sucked into the like the black hole of of pessimism and and uh, all those other negative aspects. Yes, yes, absolutely. You're pointing to a great way to 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 figure out where do you stand, right? Because sometimes people will say, well, is what I'm experiencing an actual just early sign? Is it an early sign? Or is it just part of normal, you know, work life is demanding and, you know, it's the way yeah. it is. And one of the ways to see where where you're at is to look at yeah the frequency how often are you feeling this way so very cynical for example um and how how severe it is so is it a little oh i'm a bit annoyed or is it i can't stand it anymore so if you're on the i can't stand it anymore mm -hmm. and it's happening every day now we've got the frequency and the severity so it is telling us that you're moving on that slide down towards burnout 
Mm-hmm. But then the other thing I would say is as early as we are, even when it's, I actually would say it's even better if we're not yet at all on that yeah. sliding path, <laughs> the more we can take a moment, it is, does not take a long moment, but to take mm-hmm. a moment to actually be strategic about how we're going to build our resilience and protect it if we're at a very good place right now, then it literally becomes a competitive advantage in addition to allowing us to bring our best in both professional and personal life, which the psychologist side of me is loving that, but the business side of me is also loving the competitive advantage it represents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I love this idea of just fostering these daily habits that can help us uh, just be more physically healthy, more mentally healthy, more yeah. emotionally healthy, just more resilient overall, because everyone deals with stuff. Everyone will have hard things hit their lives, whether it be illness or family tragedy or whatever, like name the thing. Everyone has those things. Yes. And you hope, you know, hopefully you're not dealing with anything like that right now, but if you're not, chances are you will at some point. Right. And so just Proactively developing those good habits is really going to go a long way for when those inevitable types of challenges do arise. You know, again, whether it be a career challenge, a a relationship challenge, whatever. Uh, And so let's talk about what some of those those daily habits, those consistent habits are that we can start to foster and develop so that we can be, you know, more emotionally healthy, more healthy relationships in our lives so we can be more uh physically healthy and and of course all of these mesh together right you have like this venn diagram of how all these things connect with each other and ultimately can lead to uh a, you know kind of like an inoculation towards burnout it it serves as a yes uh, in a way protective factor it, it's not yeah. a guarantee so it's not like a an absolute immunity but mm-hmm. that definitely mitigates and yeah. uh, and you know in I often say, we'll say it's, it is increasing our baseline so that when we yeah. get there, yes, the demands will take some of it, but then we're starting from a higher point. And, uh, and you're right. We want to have clarity on what these actions are. But you know, one thing, uh, Jonathan, I'm, I'm hearing a lot is that more and more, especially now having gone through the pandemic, mm-hmm. we've heard about some of these things. A lot of people is they will have actually decent information about what these things could look like. Yeah. The problem is the in the implementation. I'll still share with just so we all of us have this on our uh, radar right here, but then I'll explain what I think is the the place where we have an opportunity. So there are a number of things we can do that will increase our resilience have been shown by research decades. So it's not just one study body of research solid. So four main ones, and there are others, but the four top ones, they are they have priority over others. So one is um, exercise. And here we want three type. We want cardio, strength training, and meditative type activity, which is often what's missing for a lot of people because yeah. they prefer being active, but it's actually very important. The second, and they're not in that order. All four are very, there isn't research that points to a winner. <laughs> um, so exercise, uh, nutrition extremely important for our psychological health, for our resilience. We're hearing more and more about even the gut health, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Very established Mediterranean um, diet type research really points to significant changes on our resilience, Um, our sleep, and then spending time with people we enjoy spending time with. So our relationships. Now, there are others, volunteer work, time in nature, and doing artistic activities. There are others, but these four are at the top. Now, here's the thing. Most people, if we asked 100 people on the street, they would probably come up with most of this, if not all of this. And they would wish they are incorporating. The missing point is landing this or as much of this as possible in our already full and at times overflowing lives. And that's where bringing strategy from business makes a difference. I'm happy to explain more, but I would say that's that's where we've got this opportunity. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, and the overflowing life, as you just mm-hmm. framed it, is mm-hmm. absolutely one of the biggest challenges, I think, um, to people doing what Yeah, I think most people do have a general sense of what they need to be doing. Everyone knows that we should be eating healthy, 
uh, that we should be exercising, that we should try to get good sleep. But how many adults are doing that? <laughs> <laughs> um, they exist. They actually exist, Jonathan. They, <laughs> but it's they do. A small portion, yes. They do, and in lots of good aspirations too. By the way, you know, but yeah. there's a reason why you know at the beginning January first, so many people have these New Year's resolutions because they know they know these things are important. They want to do them. They just lack, you know, the 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 willpower perhaps or the structure to sustain it. Uh, and pretty soon within a couple of weeks, you know, those those aspirational goals kind of get set by the wayside, you're busy, your life is overflowing. And you're just like, ah, I'll do it sometime, I'll do it sometime in the future. And the problem is, that future date never really comes if you don't just decide to just do it. Um, and then try to carve out time in your schedule, and, and, you know, create those habits where it just becomes second nature for you to just do it every day, uh, or consistently, you know, every week. Uh, that that's what's so important. Everyone's busy. Uh, you know, I I don't talk to many adults who who say they have so much extra free time on their hands. <laughs> Most people are overwhelmed. They're busy. They're juggling a thousand things. They're trying to do the best they can. Um, and and I I see people where they're at, and I honor people for where they're at. But also, this is really important. And you can take these positive steps. You know, start where you're at, move forward. Uh, create some of these habits, it's going to make a world of difference. And, and all of a sudden, it, it it like, you think about your potential and how much you can accomplish in a day, and your life is overflowing, right? But you start to do some of these things, all of a sudden, your like bubble of potential grows. So your capacity increases. And all of a sudden, you're overflowing is contained, like you, you don't, you can actually end up doing more, because you're doing these things uh, that help you stay grounded and more resilient and responsive to the challenges that you face. Yes. Yes. And the uh and the one of the ways that I I got there in how so how, right? So how do we bring these, yes, these habits we would want to have to see the results that you're describing right there. And then the analogy that came in my work, in my speaking and in my executive coaching work was because I had people come to me say exactly this, right? I know what I should have. I know it would benefit me. I was able to do this say 10 years, 20 years ago, but right now it just seems absolutely po impossible. What's my problem? <laughs> and, and then, you know, they're like, wait, I am resilient. That's who I am. And resilience is actually not a personality trait. It's something that evolves over time. So then I would say to them, okay, in business here, if we have a fantastic, good idea for a next product or a next service, do we have just a great idea and go implement? Or do we have this great idea? And then we look at who else is offering this? How much are they charging for it? Which forces in the future might impact it? We do all this. We look mm -hmm. at the context. And then we're going to proceed with this. Same here. We have the goal, let's say, of nourishing and increasing our resilience. It's not enough to just say, okay, go, because the life is overflowing right here. What we need is a strategy, the same way we do in business. And, and as we apply some of the key ways in which we would build a strategy in business, like identifying which values we bring as our particular organization, doing SWOT analysis, looking at the market. Here, we can do equivalence of all this, doesn't take long, but is just as powerful in creating an actual customized resilience strategic plan that is doable. And that's what people tell me. It is. It is absolutely uh, doable. And it has the impacts you're describing, because if you do it, it will be customized also to this moment in time in your mm -hmm. life. And once it's implemented, <laughs> after a few months, you'll be ready to evolve it the same way we evolve strategy in our business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I have a I have a benefit of, you know, I, my full time gig is I'm a faculty member, I'm a professor. So in the academic space, um, we have this thing called sabbatical, and it's a wonderful thing. And every six years, at least at my university, every six years, you're eligible to apply for and go on sabbatical for either half a year or a full year. Uh, I've had the chance now because I've been at, at, at my university for over 15 years. So I've had a chance to do two sabbaticals. Um, and yeah, you know, you get 
I'm I'm a fairly deeply engaged kind of professor. Like I, I'm really heavily involved in a lot of things, um, far more things than I'm required to be involved in doing things with students and places around campus and all these sorts of things. Right. And it's wonderful and I love it. But over time, if I'm not careful, I find myself saying yes to too many things, getting overburdened, overloaded. And despite my best intentions, I start to, to feel those signs of burnout. I start to see them in myself. And, and I have this wonderful mechanism of sabbatical that I, I could, I have a chance to do a reset every six years and that's exactly how it's felt for me that, you know, both times that I was able to go on sabbatical, I'm like, I am fed up. I'm so frustrated, blah, 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 you know, all the negative things. Now I can like take, take eight months off, do a mental reset, um, work on other passion projects that I'm really interested in that I felt like I was getting pulled away from, um, focus on my health, my physical, my mental health, et cetera. Um, and each time I've come back so refreshed, so re-energized, so ready to just tackle the biggest, most complex challenges, you know, by the horns and, and, and get to work. Um, and I recognize that that's not something that everyone has. <laughs> so I'm incredibly grateful for it because, because I see my tendency to overdo it and to push myself towards burnout. And I have this built-in mechanism. Yeah. If I wasn't in a place where I had that every six years, I would need to be much more proactive about making sure that I'm each and every day consistently doing those things and not allowing them to get set aside. Otherwise I would, I, I wouldn't last. I, you know, I, I would get burned out and eventually I would, I would probably leave, which would be sad because I love it here. I love this university. I love the people here. I love what I do. And it would be sad if, if I gave that up simply because of my inability to to manage my workload and how I you know my boundaries and how I interact with other people yes and you'll see how it goes for you because two things with this number one part of what happens in what you're describing with that uh, wonderful built-in uh, moment of break not only it gives you a break but it also forces a moment of checking in huh? yes, so absolutely. that that it increases that space for you to actually feel <laughs> how you're doing, given how busy things are. And so, so it does both. It, it allows you to have a moment of checking in and then, a, a, in your case, a wonderful, we're all very envious moment <laughs> um, of, of um, uh, replenishing and recovery. Now, for the two things, even for you, as you continue with time, because there's also that, right? As we continue to proceed with time, we get even more involved in even more exciting things. And also time goes by and we get older, even you and I, Jonathan. But And, and so you may find yourself potentially wanting to build in check-ins a bit more often, even in between your sabbaticals. Absolutely. And then that connects <laughs> that to the rest of us, Jonathan, who don't have those beautiful sabbaticals. That's what we need to do. And sometimes it's something people will commit to, especially if that sometimes that will be part of their actual strategic plan to say yeah. at least once a month or even once a quarter, I will take a moment to just reflect back on, okay, what's my energy levels? How am I doing given all my demands and, and my sources of supply? Can I still proceed with what I've got planned for the next few, four months, for example, and go from there? And so we want to do frequent check-ins. If we think we're not going to do them, that's in part sometimes how people will use supports in their network. Do you have a yeah. peer that you can do a regular check-in with? Do you have a mentor? Um, do you have an executive coach that you do at least a once a quarter or once a year check-in with? So make sure they help you take that one hour, which even in the most overflowing schedule, if it's you know <laughs> planned a few months in advance, you can get to it. So that you can check in because without that check-in, all of us highly, whatever, capable, performing, enjoying these massive opportunities, these challenges, these, these wonderful uh, uh, puzzles that we get to solve, we're going to be, we need to protect ourselves from ourselves and our tendency to say yes and say all this. And we're at risk of, of uh, just seeing our resilience decrease to a point where none of it sounds like fun. But if we've been proactive, then we can keep this. Yes, I, absolutely. And I fully acknowledge how lucky I am to have these built-in sabbaticals right. and how much I really need 
I, I use those as a fallback and, a, and as a crutch. Uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate to have it, but absolutely, I should be more proactive about just doing things consistently over time. So I never get to that point where I'm like desperate for my next sabbatical in and order to do go- a reset. Exactly. Then you can get to your sabbatical with even more energy, more skiing exactly. for you, Jonathan. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, MH, this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you and find out more about your work and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yes. So connecting with me, well, there's always good old LinkedIn always works. You can find me there. Um, Website, theresiliencesplan.com. It will lead to everything that I do, including uh, that book that just came out uh, in February. And uh, I would say, yes, we need to think strategically, speak strategically, and take strategic action to support our resilience. And And as much as in the workplace, everything's connected. It is a system. Individuals, teams, organization all work together to create cultures, contexts um, that we need to pay attention to. And one of those key aspects is us as individuals. It will have an impact on others. So, And we have control over that. So let's be strategic about our resilience. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what MH can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.